All right, we're recording. Go ahead. Okay. Finance Committee for May 4, 2021, to order at one o'clock. And um, this is a meeting that is uh, being held uh, as a virtual meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law chapter mass general law chapter 30a section 18 uh, since we're doing this by remote participation i'm going to check with each member of the committee to make sure that they can hear me and by their response that uh, we can hear them so um, start with kathy shane vice chair yes here and i can hear lynn guzmer Present, and I can hear. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present, I can hear everyone. And Dorothy Pam. Yes, yes. Uh, Pat D'Angelis. Yes, yes. And Bob Hegner. Yep, yep. <coughs> and uh, Jane Schefflers. You're here. Okay. Um, so, um, the agenda for today's meeting uh, starts with after the call to order, which we just did, um, to go to an overview of the town manager uh, budget. And um, I don't know if uh, you wanted us to wait, if Paul is joining us, uh, Sean, or if you're going to do the introduction. So I haven't heard that he's not joining us, but why don't I start and then... Um... If when he hops on, uh, we can see if he has anything he wants to add. Um, I wanted to say one thing before we start off is that uh, last night, of course, I didn't say anything because we had just received the budget, but I spent several hours going over it this morning and it really is an impressive document and uh, ties together uh, the goals that we're trying to achieve and is uh, a really well-designed friendly document. Obviously it was a tremendous amount of work and I wanna thank all of the uh, staff who were present on this. I saw Holly, a few uh, was here previously. I'm not sure she'd signed off. I see Sonia, I know you're here. Uh, uh, but I really want to, uh, anybody who I've missed, I just want to thank everybody for um, a tremendous effort to do that. Uh, so, Sean. Yeah, thank uh, you, Andy. It was um, Holly, Sonia, lots of department heads, um, Paul, uh, others. You know, it's easy putting together the document. It's hard then going through and checking everything to make sure it all, you know, goes back and forth because there's so many, um, so many figures in the document. But, um, but thank you. Um, so be, I'm going to share my screen in a second, pull up the document and just do a quick walkthrough um, of some of the, how it's organized and some of the key pages. Um, before I do, I just wanted to check and see, has everyone been to the Engage Amherst pages before? Is, is there anyone that hasn't been that wants a quick overview of what's on there? I see Dorothy. Dorothy. Are, are you okay, Andy, if I, if I share my screen and go there real quick and just show people what's available on that page? Sure. Um, okay. Dorothy, did you have something you were trying to say or? I can't hear you because you're muted. No, I, I had not engaged, engaged Amherst yet. Um, oh, you, you okay. definitely should. So let me, I'm going to share my screen and um, let's see, screen one. So um, hopefully you see it on your screen. It may be a little funky looking because I have wide screens, but if you go to engageamherst.org, um, It'll bring you here. And if you scroll down to, there's multiple initiatives that are gonna keep coming up on here. So it's good to get comfortable with this um, page. Um, the budget is the featured one right now. So you just click on learn more. And hopefully you all see it switch over to the FY22 budget. And there's a little bit of a, a sort of a greeting and there's, Lots of different tools that people uh, that we can put on this, but there are the two that we've selected for this process is um, a Q&A, 
which allows any uh, people to submit a question and that question will come to us. We can review it, make sure, you know, there's no, nothing problematic in the question in terms of language or anything like that. Um, and then we can answer it and it'll create a running list here of the, of the questions and the answers. Um, and it will also send an email directly back to the person who submitted the question with the answer. So it's a really nice um, uh, tool. And anybody who's listed on this, who's listening over here on the right, um, right now it's myself and um, the communications manager, Brianna Sundred, um, gets that email. So, so, it keeps every, so we can add as many people over there as we want. Um, and then there's another tool here that's feedback. And if you click the, the feedback button, you can submit um, feedback as well. I'm not gonna do it right now, but um, the, it give, lets you submit an open-ended response. And it also lets you, we put the goals, the, the, the uh, town manager's goals there so that people could kind of weigh in on what ones they feel are most important to them. Um, Sean, a question. Is there yeah. something that the user can make the type bigger? Oh yeah. The type on this, yeah, this looks, sorry, this looks really, again, small because I can't really control it because it's a web page, but um, I'll make my other little bigger when I go to the budget how, document. How would, how would a, a user do that? Um, so when you go that. here, it'll be much bigger than what you see on your screen, I think, unless you're, have you, did you go to it on your computer? Yeah, and D Dorothy, on your computer, you can just enlarge what you're looking, you know, the computer, I can, if, you I can tell you how to. fingers on the screen, on the pad? Yeah, you can, you can always make the image bigger, so I can. Okay. If you some, sometimes some images allow you to do that and some don't. Yeah, no, there's no, a, you're right. on your keypad, you can actually just expand it. Even if the it's not built in, you can make the picture bigger. Um, and then the I'm here sighted, so I need to do that <laughs> lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah. And the last thing I'll just point out is on the side here, here the, the other nice thing about this page is it kind of links to all the main things you need to go to. So it's got links on the right to the, the budget document, the capital improvement program, um, the the presentation from last night, uh, the budget calendar, town council goals, there's some FAQs there, and we're going to add key dates to it as well as um, meetings come up. So, uh, so there's, it, it worked pretty well for some projects so far. So we're going to keep trying it. Mm -hmm. and sure. I, yeah. I just have a quick question. Not, I, I mean, I think this is great, but a year from now or at some point in the future, are you and Bianca going to be able to assess the payoff to the extra time this took, you know, in terms of users' comments, because I'm assuming this feature, as opposed to the book that you put up, took a fair amount of time, somebody's time. So, yeah, I mean, so it, it's actually not as bad as you would think, because they're sort of, you know, templates, and so it's really just updating the template with some of the information that's already in the budget document. But it, it your, to your point, it is more time than if we just didn't do anything. And, and we just relied on sort of meetings um, to, to facilitate some of this back and forth. So there is more time um, there. The nice thing about this tool is it has a lot of um, data analytics that you can see of um, how many people visit the page. There's also like deeper levels of data, like how many people actually engage with the page. So not just visit it, but actually like use one of the tools. Um, there, there's a, that's one of actually the strengths of this uh, program is that you can see a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that uh, Brianna can analyze is really useful to see, you know, what people are, are doing. So, Sean, I, oh. I, I might just to follow up, because what I might do at a district meeting is demo it and ask people to have who have always wondered about it to try to go on mm. it and, see, and ask them just to then submit comments on, you know, going the normal way to look at the budget versus could they find things more easily? Yeah. Could they, if you want, maybe if you're okay with it, maybe I'll just email Brianna and Paul and just let them know that you're thinking of that. And, and Brianna can probably reach out to you. She's, she's the expert on this. Okay, so she great. can probably reach out and let you know the, the best way to do that. Okay, great. Yeah, so, and we John, would... I had a question. Oh, Paul's here. Um, so, yeah. um, so, so we would really appreciate you doing that too, Kathy. So thank you for thinking of that. So, so here's my question. We have, let's just say, a constituent who wants to know lots of answers and hasn't really been following the meetings and doesn't know how to find them. So, and for example, if they wanted questions, uh, answers about the library, could I say, go to engage com or .org, which is it? Uh, it's .org. .org. And then how would they find library? So the library, I don't believe is a project specifically on here. And I don't want to take up too much time on this, but I'll just show one thing real quick. Um, uh, let me just go back to the main yeah, page. So there's a, a four building projects one that has some Q&A on there. Okay. 
um, really, so financing the future. So we set this up for the Ford building project plan. Okay. And so the really nice feature that we've heard in the past of like questions get asked and then they get asked again and again and again. And so it'd be nice to kind of catalog them. That's one reason why we try to direct people to use this tool because, mm -hmm. so this is all the questions that have been asked are right here. So you can see, mm -hmm. again, this is really small. So I apologize, you probably can't see the actual question, okay. but um, there's a question and then there's a response and then there's a question and there's a response. And so you can see everything that's been asked so far and the response. Um, and, and that may, you know, kind of builds an FAQ document or, or a question document um, for people to review. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if they, they can't use this then for the library, they would go to some other place to find that the budget and the plan or whatever. Um, so I think, so the, the library project itself, yeah, I, I think because that's kind of already come up to the council for a vote, it, it would be sort of too late for something like this. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the account, the library's webpage has a lot of information as well. Um, that might be a good place to start is to go to the, the project page that the Jones Library set up. Okay. Oh yeah. And there, and there is that, there, there, there's that very long question document that we, that we all spent a lot of time on um, that, you know, they, they probably should start there. Okay. Um, I think that is, and, and that, um, I'll send you the link after, uh, Dorothy, that is posted okay. on our website. So I'll send you the link to where that long question document is for the library. This is really great stuff. So, um, so congratulations to everybody who put this together. I think this is really very helpful. I've enjoyed looking at the, at the engaged site. Um, and Sean, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll log on at midnight during your ask me anything. And uh, <laughs> on I think Twitter, I got, no less. Yeah, I think I got one last year that was sort of off hours, but otherwise most of the questions were, were fine. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to switch over to the budget document. And I won't, again, this is just going to be a high level overview for those who haven't had a chance to really kind of dig into it yet. Is this size okay or is this small on your screen? No, I think it's fine. Okay. It works for me. It's okay for you, okay. Um, so I'm just gonna go through. So one of the new features we added this year and, and a lot of the stuff we added was, um, it's related to the, the GFOA, which is the Governmental Finan Financial Officers Association. It's, um, they have a sort of best practice listing of things. And so a lot of stuff we added is related to that. So one of the things is sort of a really brief summary that if somebody just wanted the highlights of the budget this year, um, they could go to one single page. And so that's what this is meant to be. And we know that this isn't perfect this year that we added a lot of new stuff and we'll, we'll refine it based on the feedback we get. Um, but that's what this page is meant to be. What's the budget? How's it allocated? What are some of the highlights? What are some of the key dates? That kind of thing. Um, table of contents, if you haven't tried it yet, the nice thing about the table of contents is you can click on the number and it'll bring you directly to the, the page. So you don't have to do a lot of scrolling. So, you know, if you want to go to um, what's new, you can just click the little 14 and it'll bring you to that section in the budget document. Um, so it'll, when it's a long budget document like this, it's nice to have that. Um, and I would go back. So the, um, it's organized into five major sections, uh, executive summary, which has town manager's budget message, um, has the goals of the, of the council and how the, the budget supports those goals um, and some really baseline financial information. I think we're gonna take that section and probably create a separate document on the, um, on the web to put on our website. And so it can be like a standalone little executive summary if people want a, a shorter document to navigate um, that kind of gives them the complete picture, but not with too much detail. And then the second section is organizational. So that's um, sort of high level planning challenges, um, our staffing, org charts, things like that. And you get into the stuff that is very similar to how it's been done in the past, maybe with a little bit different coloring and pictures and things like that. But the financial section has a lot of the same um, departmental information that you're used to seeing in the past. And I imagine will be probably the guide us through our, um, our department meetings with the uh, coming up in the next few meetings. And then informational section has things like the indicators report on our policies, OPEB. Um, there's a link to the capital improvement program because we didn't want, we're trying to stay under 300 pages and didn't want to, didn't want to break that barrier. So we just linked to some of these documents instead of putting them in the, in the whole thing. Um, 
And then the nice thing that, you know, we heard some feedback last year that I don't know if people have seen yet, but we put the anticipated appropriation orders related to the FY22 budget at the very end. So if you go to that page um, and you scroll down and, and I wanna thank Sonia cause she does a really good job of staying on top of all the votes we have to take. It's not easy um, to figure out all the votes, not, not just the votes, but where the votes are coming from because it's not always intuitive and, and tie nicely. But on that last page, you'll see um, all the FY22 votes, what they are, you know, theory, where they're, the funding source is. Um, and this, is, this will help keep us on track as we go through the process to make sure that we hit all these different things. Um, and then the only other thing I'll point out right now and see if there's any questions is, um, you know, I, I, we've talked about this a little bit already. So the, you know, this page right here is consolidated spending summary it sort of gives you the complete view of the budget It has the general fund budget, which includes the capital improvement program. And then it also gives you the enterprise funds. So if you wanted the one place to go to see sort of the full picture um, that, that's projected right now for FY22, it would probably be this page on page 27. Um, that should be familiar to you in terms of how it's arranged. It's consistent with how we do our um, the financial indicators report and things like that. Anything else, Sonia, Holly, Paul, you think we should highlight in this or is that an okay overview? I think it's a lot. Um, it's it's a different than last year. Our, um, so one of the things I think Sean said, but we're really eager to hear your feedback because you know we worked through this and there's a lot of things to put together. It was outside our comfort zone for a lot, a lot of us. And so I think we can do better next year. Uh, we know even after last night, there are things that we would do differently. So uh, we want to hear all those things from you as we go through this process. Well, Paul, you came on late. So I'll just tell you that it, Right at the beginning, um, I commented that I spent a couple hours uh, going working just with the document this morning and really appreciated um, how it's set up, how it's organized. Uh, you know, it, it seems daunting at first, but it really is not when you spend a little bit of time with it. And um, I just was expressing my appreciation to all of the people, but you weren't there. Um, who worked on it because it really was a tremendous effort, I realized. And, uh, you know, I, for one, appreciate it very much. And I think the, probably the rest of the committee does too. And, and one other page I'll just point out real quick that might be um, helpful for some people to go to if they're not, you know, first would be this um, section we added on goals. So it lays out the council's goals um, and then it lays out the specific initiatives or the, the highlights of the initiatives that are in this budget plan um, for next year. So you can see how the budget sort of supports the different goals. Um, you know, the challenge this year is that we're still coming out of the pandemic. Um, we still are not doing a two and a half percent increase. So um, in a lot of ways, we're, we're, we're not all the way back clearly. Um, so it, it was not an easy budget year by any means in terms of the money available. And, and we heard from the schools um, so that, that was one of the challenges this year, but, um, so th this will, I think, start to look better as we go forward with the things we can do. So I will stop sharing. And if there's any other questions, if not, we can switch over to the, um, capital improvement program. I, so I have my, a comment. It, yeah. I mean, my one question comment is, is that. It seems that a lot of the uh, likely expenditures that are, we're going to be able to make during the year because of the American Recovery Act are, in, a set, in essence, not budgeted, budgeted because they weren't known and they're not part of the budget itself, but they're really very essential. And how that works and how we're, you know, what our role as a finance committee and a council is on those are something that I was thinking that we probably need to give some discussion to at some point. Yeah, no, we, we certainly struggled with that. Um, you know, we heard some feedback on the schools as well. And, and we didn't want to ignore the grant because it, it's going to be a big part of FY22. And, um, and it's, and it specifically meant to make up for some of the economic impacts that we've dealt with and that we're experiencing for FY22. So we did want to begin to, to put thoughts to how we, um, you know, some ways we see spending that money. Um, but you're right, it's sort of in this 
it's, unfortunately the timing is not great with how that um, how the grant is kind of being rolled out. It's sort of right at the same time budgets are being voted. So other uh, looks uh, we go through multiple layers. Uh, Dorothy, you have your hand up. So do you have a question? You I, want to I have a comment. Um, I would strongly recommend not using blue when you particularly when you had blue as headlines, the blue disappears. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps using boldface or all caps um, because the most important words disappeared and they really help organize the structure and make it easy to use. I, I, I'm sure that if it's printed, you can read the blue, but on the screen, it's, it okay. did not work for me. Can and you I give me an example of that, Dorothy, where that's happened? I'm just, when you so had the whole index and you had the, the key words were in light blue, and uh, then okay. you had the subtopics. And the, gotcha. key, the key words okay. are the most important thing in terms of looking, looking down. It's like an MLA uh, work cited. Right. You want to be able to see the headings very quickly by the formatting. Okay. Yeah, we might be able to fix that up uh, quickly. That, that might yeah. be something we can clean up. Okay, thank you. Other comments, questions on the overview? So, um, is there anything, because the other thing that, that I think we'll probably just be talking about it throughout the process is that this budget is much uh, different and much more helpful in the way of linking um, council goals and future plans it back into the budget as opposed to being sort of out there in a separate world. But I think um, it strikes me that we're going to be dealing with those questions as we go through each section of the budget. For example, uh, obviously when we talk about the police budget and social services budget, we'll get into the obvious issues having to do with the uh, recommendations of the working group and um, future relationships and planning for that. Um, and just for the committee as a whole and for any, uh, just to make it clear where we're, I think you all have the uh, budget calendar that um, Sean put together and uh, has the dates for each meeting and the estimated time, who's going to be present, and what finance committee member is assigned to it. A um, couple things about this. One is that um, I did uh, include, as you know, in the finance committee report town meeting that people should uh, send to those of us who are assigned each time to sections of the budget if they have questions that they would like to have added to the list that they come originally through um, the finance committee person who's assigned to the section and um, what we want to do is that ultimately that you should get them to Sean because Sean might be able to answer some of the questions himself and he can sort who's the best person to get them to and get them sent out. And I think that that was what is understood to be part of the process. Uh, Sean, did you have a time um, goal for when you would like to see the questions from the committee member? Um, nothing specific. I think giving the department heads, if, if you, some of it's not gonna be possible just because of the condensed schedule but um, and, and the length of the budget document. But if you can give them at least a couple days, um, to work on questions, especially, you know, and it also kind of depends how many questions there are. Um, you know, if it's a, if it's more than one page of questions, you might want to give them a little bit more time, especially if it's going to be pulling um, data or, or something along those lines. So, um, I think just kind of judge it by the the length of the how many questions you have and and what would be reasonable. But I think every all the department heads are ready for it. We met with them today. We let them know. Um, they, they know who's assigned to them. We let them know that questions would be coming soon um, now that the budget's been presented. So um, they're all ready. Any questions from the committee or suggestions that anybody, uh, Kathy? Um, just, just sort of a, a, it's either a question or a comment. If 
Others have a section that they would like to be reading or have questions that isn't assigned to them. So, you know, I have Pat and I are splitting police and fire. Um, if I read another section like Lynn's education, should I send quickly, if I, should I send them to you? Should I send them to Lynn just to avoid duplication that we're thinking of the same things and it's already been asked. So what would be a way it's, you know, or, or there are counselors who aren't on finance, who aren't assigned to anything. Same, same question. Um, how do we make it not feel duplicative or not have different things coming in at different time periods? I think, to, I think Andy um, touched on this briefly. I think you should send that to the person who's assigned to that section, um, just so they don't ask the same question. Um, so if it's for the schools, for example, um, and you have questions on those, send them to Lynn and then Lynn can make sure she's not also asking the same one or, or if she is, and she can let you know that she's already asking that. Okay. Does that make, I think you, I think that's how you described it, um, Andy, right? Yeah, I think that's what I, what I was thinking, sir. Um, that's what I expressed in the finance committee report to, to the council, because I was, uh, just um, didn't want to have multiple sets of uh, questions going in multiple directions. And I think you're absolutely right that we, we want to assemble them. And if you see, um, if you're assigned to a section, um, police in this, in uh, several questions come in that are pretty much identical, um, that you can sort them down. One, the only comment that I received from a counselor who's not on this committee um, about this subject was that um, she wanted to know whether there was a way that uh, we were going to get the information back and what her suggestion was that we include in uh, committee reports each time there's a council meeting um, a sort of a summary of key points that we've heard um, through the process and not wait until the end when we have the final report so that people can um, absorb that and if they have follow-up plots that they want to pursue that they'll know what questions to raise during the council discussion of the, the report can come out earlier. So that I thought was an um, an interesting suggestion and something that I might want to try, but it's one additional thing that I'll probably be looking to the key person who's been assigned to that section to also help with so that we can make sure that it, um, the key points get included in the finance committee reports that go back if we do that. So other thoughts about uh, our, our committee process and working with the budget? Okay. The, uh, the only thing I'm going to ask is that there's probably going to be certain sections of the budget people are much more honing in on than others. Um, and so when we bring those back to the council prior to the full report, I just need a heads up as to whether or not, how much time and in what way we want to bring that to an actual council meeting. Um, I think public safety is clearly in that category. Well, uh, I think that's a decision that uh, probably you need to make with Evan and uh, Paul in one of the agenda meetings is to how much time, if any, you want to just um, allocate to budget discussion prior to the final when the budget comes out. Putting it in the report uh, is one thing, but allocating significant time for discussion at the meetings, I think we need guidance from, from you in that capacity. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So Sean, do you, uh, is there anything else that you want to say on the budget as a whole, or did you want to turn over to the capital improvement? Um, I think I will turn over to the capital improvement if um, you're okay with that. So I'm going to share my screen again. 
Um, so uh, the capital improvement program went through the joint capital planning committee. Um, they've had it at the beginning of their process. So it was the one really nice thing about this year is that we um, received feedback sort of on the document itself, but also on the, what was in the document. And so we tried to reflect, uh, we, we reflect a lot of the feedback that we received from the Joint Capital Planning Committee is in this document already. Um, so let me just go to some of the key pages. No light blue on the contents, nailed it there. Um, let's see. Um, there's a pie chart. This is similar to the pie chart you saw last night in the, um, in the story map. So I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, this was the JCPC um, schedule, if anybody wants to, to review how many meetings there were on Capitol, but we had, we had um, Kathy Shane was the chair of that committee and, and led a very robust process. Um, we had department presentations and things of that nature. Um, and so you can see what was discussed at each meeting. So this page is probably one of the more important. This is the um, summary and it's got a lot of numbers. So I'll just do a quick overview of what it is. Um, the top is the funding side of capital and the bottom is the expenditure side of capital. And so on the funding side at the top, we um, the, the shaded gray is FY22 proposed, um, but we also project out four more years so that we have a five-year plan. And so the top is the tax levy. And then below that, where you see cash capital, when we talk about a certain percentage of the tax levy, that's this row right here. So for FY22, the proposal is eight and a half percent of the tax levy for capital. And the eight and a half percent is of the prior, of the two year prior tax levy, just in case somebody tries to do the math. It's, it's the, the last tax levy that we knew for sure when we put this together, which would have been the, um, for this particular year would have been the FY20 tax levy. So we built into the five-year plan, the, the proposed plan that was presented to finance committee for funding the four building projects. So just keep that in mind. And when you look at the out years, you may want to, the out years are more important this year, maybe than in other years, because we have built that planning into this, into this summary. Um, so when you get to like debt exclusion override, normally that row is zero. Um, because we don't, we haven't had one of those in a while. But um, since we are proposing one of those for the school as part of that plan, um, you'll see it in some of those out years. Um, so you've got your cash capital and these other, the section here that I'm highlighting are the other fun, possible funding sources for capital. So you've got the debt exclusion override, you've got reserves, uh, Community Preservation Act, which is just the debt portion of Community Preservation Act, just to be clear, it's debt only. Um, forgot to update this term, but Comcast funding. So this is a new, uh, a new component this year. Uh, we get, we're receiving money to partially offset the installation of the municipal fiber, fiber that was installed throughout town. And so as we begin to pay the debt on that, we are applying money from um, Comcast in this case to help offset that debt. And so that's why you'll see it running out for a number of years because it's related to a debt payment. Um, other funding sources, it's typically if it's coming from a revolving fund or, or some other type of grant or closing out a prior year um, capital article. So in FY22 in particular, the 761 is the closeout. Um, it's two things. It's the closeout of the FY21 capital reserve that wasn't spent. That has now been appropriated for, FY, or it's proposed to be appropriated for FY22 to support the FY22 plan. And it also includes um, a couple other articles that were closed out from FY21. These, these were individual articles, um, one for a zoning project and one for, I forgot what the other one was, something, um, a, a smaller one. So again, this is reappropriated prior year articles essentially. And then state aid is just is, uh, chapter 90 funding that goes mostly towards roads. So this again kind of makes up the funding picture um, in terms of the, the uh, cash funding. And then there's one other piece here that just to be aware of is borrowing. So if we're proposing to borrow a project, we're showing it, it's sort of in between these two areas because you're not gonna actually uh, start paying on the borrowing. That's gonna be paid over a number of years. And so you'll see the, the projected debt payments, those 
projected debt payments below are specifically tied to whatever we say the borrowing is. So for FY22, we're proposing 4.6 million worth of borrowing. And I believe one of the handouts in your packet gives a breakdown of what's in that number. Um, there are uh, three sort of projects, and then there is the DPW and fire station building project, uh, the design and OPM services for that. Um, and then if you keep going down, and maybe I'll pause after this because I see there's a couple of questions, so I'll, I'll stop after this. And then you have the expenditure side. So um, we start with the actual debt that is on our books that we have to pay, um, any projected debts, which is really looking more at the out years, and then new projects that are gonna be um, paid for in cash that, that specific year. And then down below, again, you have, um, outside of sort of cash items, you have the debt exclusion override, which is a wash with the revenue source up above. So this would only happen if there actually is a debt exclusion override um, in the future. And then you have other, which would be the payments from the, the prior year closed out articles. So you have the revenue source and then a matching expense. And then state aid, same thing, you have a revenue source and then a matching expense. So it's sort of some, you got there's some times where the same term shows up in both places and it's because it comes in and then it's spent and it goes out. And then the most important line at the bottom is over under available funding. So the FY22 plan is uh, after going through JCPC, it wasn't balanced to begin going through JCPC, but by the end of the process, it was in balance um, based on their recommendations. And then you can see the out years um, that are more or less in balance with a little bit of flexibility as we go further out, um, which is normal because the out years projects are still sort of being formulated. And so those numbers will surely decrease as we get closer to those years. And so I'll, I guess, Anthony, Andrew, if, uh, Andy, sorry, if it's possible, maybe I'll stop there and see if there's any um, questions on this chart before I keep going. Yeah, I think there are two members of the committee who had their hands up and I had one question, but let's uh, go with them because I may, might ask my question. So, so Kathy. Hi, um, thanks, Sean, for this. And also thank you all because the recommendations from JCPC seem largely in here. So my, my question is um, on the debt service for DPW and fire, which is in here. Mm -hmm. um, and I do understand what it's in there for. I'm, I have a two part question. One is we haven't made a decision on DPW and fire, but you have, in fact, as you said, there's been a proposed way to do everything during mm -hmm. this time period. So we are moving forward on the elementary school and it's never been entirely clear to me how much money we've already appropriated for the OPM plus any schematic design. So it's a, do we need to have a placeholder for more money than that before we get to we actually have a project that we're debt service finding. So was, was that clear? You know, because yeah, there's, no, that's, that's there's, a good... not, there's not a line item in there for schools. And so it's a question of, were we going to use, we could use reserves for it, for example. Um, so, and I don't quite know what, seeing how big the number is. So just for people, if you look forward, the um, number the 3.4 million of that 4.6 is the DPW and fire, the two, two which are each well over a million. So I'm thinking the school will be easily that as well. So that, right. that's my question on trying, and I know we haven't made the decision, but how fungible is this as we're trying to think about it, what we're gonna need in 22 for the school? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so kind of good news is that the school, um, the funding for design and OPM services through feasibility study has was already approved by the council, um, and it's already in in these numbers. I think it was um, seven hundred fifty thousand, and I'll, maybe Sonia can double confirm for me. Um, but we've already got a projection of of that in these numbers. Is that right, Sonia? I can't see her, so I don't know if she's. So, and you're crazy or okay, what? So, so uh, let's say that is the number. And then my question would be, suppose it's more like a million, you know, when we're running into it, that we're moving faster we and we're getting more deeply into. So that's my question. Um, so we've already got 750. So that's why it's not going to be as much as the 1.2 million 
each for DPW employer. Right. And it's a little bit different process too, because you do a feasibility study. And so, so the contracts right now are to fund portions of those contracts through the feasibility study. The money we're asking for um, or proposing for FY22 for design, um, for design for the fire station and DPW, it goes farther than that because that they, they don't follow the same process that the money we're proposing would get us through construction documents and, and up to bidding. Um, the money for the school, again, because of the working with them, MSBA and, and the process they use, it, um, it gets you to like schematic design essentially. Um, and so it's, so it's a little bit, it's not really apples to apples when comparing the total dollar amount for those projects. Okay, and that's just the, the I don't know when, when we will make that decision, but um, as you know, I'm, I'm focused on schools, the school right now. Um, I wouldn't want to hit a roadblock just because we haven't um, earmarked money for mm -hmm. whatever piece we might need in FY, because there's nothing in 23 or 24 either. So when I was looking forward, it, you don't hit school until we do, the, the, at least I don't think I saw it. Maybe mm -hmm. I didn't look far enough. No, no, the, the, the money that we appropriated, the 750, um, that were not appropriate, but that was authorized already, um, it covers through the feasibility study up until the next stage of that project, which, um, we're, we're in the process of getting the OPM on board and the designer, which will help guide how long of a process that will be, but um, no. Yes, that, that was just, what, which is for you, you and Paul will know these numbers better, but if we needed money beyond that in that 23, 24, before we're going out for the whole building, which is the, um, I'm, as I've been worried that we are really loading up, as everyone can see what, what's happening, if you go down to the um, line that says projected debt, um, tw in 2023 is when we start seeing the debt for the library. It's, there's a jump up of new, new projects, and then it's steadily going up what we're, we're spending on actual debt plus projected. So uh, we, we have a pretty tight, capital budget going forward, as everyone knows. So just, that's it. That was my question and comment on um, that, that, yeah. Thank you, Kathy. So Bernie, I guess. Uh, uh... Thanks, Andy. Um, just a quick question. If you look in the, um, in the cell, the uh, uh, other cell, the 761, 522, there's a little red care flag up in the corner. Yeah. And you go over, there's a couple of little green flags mm -hmm. on uh, on cells and, and on the projected ones. And going forward through the document, those little red flags, green flags reappear. I'm just wondering what they mean, or is that just an artifact? Yeah, no, of... there's probably a way to hide them. So those are um, those are in the, so this, this is an Excel table. And so, yeah. the, so the red flag means that there's a comment and I'm sure the comment in this particular case, yeah. which I, well, I can't see in the PDF, but it just flags that it probably breaks down what the 7061 well, is, which was, is, yeah. Okay, that was my, my guess is those were comments that yeah. should ordinarily be hidden, but yeah, I was just curious. All right, thanks. Dorothy? Okay, so um, I'm still working on understanding this. Uh, when you use the phrase out years, you mean the future years, but yeah. I guess I'm used to hearing out years as meaning years that somehow don't behave like the other years, but it just means future year to you, right? Yeah. So in this case, I, I ref when I say that, I mean FY23 through FY26. Right. So not, not the year that you're considering specifically this year, not the year you're going to be voting on, but the year, the four years in this plan beyond that. So then you said something and it was maybe the over under available funding and you said the numbers would go down as we get there. And I guess I, we're so used to having numbers go up as we go into the future. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's sort of the same thing. Um, so right now, the way this over under, under looks, it's showing that we have available funds. We have more money that we can spend in mm -hmm. like FY26. You'll see it shows that there's available funding of 781. That number I will Oh, go I, down right, as right. we get closer to FY26. Right. You know, we, we work with department heads to try to project out needs yeah. um, five years away, but it's just, you're never going to project out the needs to the same extent um, as you can the year coming up. So we, uh, so that's why there's a little bit of a, a sur uh, surplus at this point. But again, as we get closer, those numbers will start to come down. I got it. Thank you. Uh, 
time? Um, yeah. Uh, so, Sonia, did you check? Was it 750? Because I know at one point we increased it. It's 750, yes. And it was voted in February of 20. Okay. We originally, I think, were like 600 or something, then went to 750. I okay. think we had a placeholder of 400. And then once we got closer, I knew what it was going to be. We increased yeah. it to 750. Thank you. Uh, then my next question is, I, I know that we start with MSBA with them saying they will not reimburse that because they already gave us feasibility money once, but then there has been a discussion from time to time that maybe as we go along, they actually might reimburse that. And I didn't or reimburse part of that, half of that, I guess. And I didn't know whether that there had been any further discussion about that. Um, yeah, I think it's a I think it's a hope, but not something we're going to count on. I think some of it comes down to whether or not there are parts of this feasibility study that are new and not something right. that have already been done before. And right. um, so I, I I guess I I just would say not, we're not expecting it, but it, we will try for it. Right. Yeah, and that's based. On, I would just like to add to that that you know, um, just speaking with people who know the MSBA said don't expect that to come through. So we are okay. we're not banking on that at all. Thank you. Uh, and then, uh, so I know, I understand that you're interviewing and getting ready to offer for OPM for um, the school. And I, I have always assumed, I think I've been told that that OPM will not be the same as the OPM for fire and DPW. Likely not. Um, I, I don't, a lot of times the OPMs for school projects are very specialized. Um, right. So I, I can't say for certainty that they will not be the same, but I don't expect it. Um, we will do a, a sort of a bid process for the OPM for the DPW and, and fire station um, in a similar but slightly different fashion than the MS, MSBA's process. Um, so I, I don't expect it. Okay, thanks. And, you know, Lynn, just on looking at the bids that we do have, uh, the one so far that's the leader didn't have fire and DPW. One of the others did have those projects listed. So when Sean says some of them are more specialized, some you saw a lot of, they had some libraries, they had some fire stations in addition to schools. So. Yeah. These companies have different arms. Right. Have different people in them. I just didn't, I was curious more than anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I'm going to keep going. And did you have a Before you go beyond yeah. that page, just um, there are other funding sources we've used over the years in capital, like um, ambulance fund. Yeah, so that's actually this other, um, Andy, that's one of the sources that's in this other category. Okay. Yep. No, but you're, you're absolutely right. Okay, go on. Then. And, and, there, and just to, be, to um, wrap that up, there's no none of that's proposed for FY22. So none of this 761 is, um, is ambulance proposed, but in the out years in FY23 through FY26, um, it does show up. All right, so then the next section I won't spend a lot of time on, but it's all of the specific projects. Um, there's a few pages of this and you can see projects for FY22 highlighted in the, in the first column there in yellow. Um, and then the projects that have been identified in future years. And one of the things that Joint Capital Planning Committee was uh, pretty clear about was there are several projects on the list for FY23 through FY26 that could be CPA eligible and that we should pursue CPA funding for those um, you know, when possible. So that's one nice thing about the CPA process being a little bit earlier this year is that that can happen before JCPC starts. And then the next section is the description, is, is a description. The full write-ups of the projects are all posted in the packets for the meetings that they were discussed. Um, so this, this is more of just a summary of, the, um, of each project. And one thing we added this year was to try to, we wanted to start kind of threading the, the sustainability lens throughout the entire <laughs> document. And so one of the projects that we feel have a, have, could improve the town's um, reduce the town's carbon footprint um, are highlighted with sort of this little green leaf. And again, that's something we'll improve on as we go forward. Um, this particular one that's on the screen right here, I'll just highlight, you heard a little bit about it last night. This is the 100,000 that was added for FY22. 
that, um, and we suspect there'll be a recurring item for this for sustainability projects. Um, and you can see the description there. I'll keep going and almost done. Um, you know, one of the new things, and this is another where we took uh, some direction from JCPC as we, we talked about projects that aren't ready to be on the five-year plan for a variety of reasons and identifying them somewhere else in the capital improvement program. And we, we the first version of the capital Pro improvement program kind of just listed them. Um, for some members of JCPC, that was sort of confusing or, or it wasn't as clear. There was a recommendation to maybe break those into multiple groups. And so we, we tried to do that um, in a way that made sense. And again, this is a page that I think we can improve over time, um, but we tried to put things here that are on our radar, um, but just aren't ready to be on the full plan for, for different reasons. And this is just a little chart on uh, asset maintenance and what we spend on different facilities in town. This was prior year approved. Um, so these are all the capital articles that were approved with balances um, that are three years or older. So any project from FY18 or before that still has money available is listed here. And this was in response to kind of getting a status check of how these projects are spending out their money. So uh, you'll, you'll see the project, this 40,000 that I mentioned was for gateway, um, was for zoning. This is one of the, art, the prior year articles that's been repurposed to support something else for FY22. And you'll see that in the status. Um, and you can see a status check for each of these. And I think the last thing I'll just highlight is at the end, you'll, you get into the inventory. Again, this is another area we can certainly um, will improve on as we normalize the process, um, but it's broken into two sections. There's sort of a building and infrastructure section, and there is a um, vehicle and equipment section. And so, and one of the pieces of feedback that we received from JCPC was to highlight the vehicles that are expected to be replaced with the vehicles that are proposed. So the, um, the, the vehicles that are highlighted in red are the ones that are, uh, you'll see throughout this list, are ones that are proposed to be replaced um, if the new vehicles are approved. And with that, I will stop. Hey, Kathy, did you, you had your hand up first, so I wanted to... Okay, yeah, um, I just have, um, I have a suggestion and I think this is sort of already in print, but um, in, under the sustainability, we had a resident proposal from two high school students for solar canopies on parking lots. Uh -huh. And that generated a lot of excitement and uh, people were delighted to see it was going forward. I realized we've got it flagged for try to do grant funding. I'm wondering if there is a way in this document to mention that that came in, you know, whether it's a footnote, a flag to just acknowledge it because it's, it's the resident proposals are seen by residents as a way to participate and to acknowledge that it influenced a decision. It's, it's flagged in, as you know, Sean, it's flagged in the JCPC report where it's when we received it, but whether it's one additional sentence in that sustainability, this would include canopies and originally proposed by high school students because they were those who weren't on the camera, they were eloquent about this, mm -hmm. you know, um, the, fut the future is now and climate. So just acknowledging that that's where that came from. So it's a sentence, a footnote, a something to make it be part of the town manager's capital plan. Yeah. Yeah, I can connect with I can connect with Paul um, about that after, and if there's a way we can highlight that. I don't know if it if we'd want to put in that summary or if we you know there, there might be other ways we can acknowledge that we received that and that that yeah, is. So I'm saying that somewhere yeah. you know somewhere and particularly because you're not necessarily spending that hundred thousand but we said if you need to draw it on right. it you know okay yeah. thanks mm -hmm. did you have a question um i do um i i actually meant to ask this back earlier any um recovery money was that in the grant line item or are you just not putting that in at all yet? Yeah, there's no, um, so again, this this is one of the things that was sort of developed. The, the version that went to JCPC was developed sort of prior to a lot of knowledge about the recovery money. So there's not anything here specifically that's proposed to be funded from the recovery money. Um, 
the one thing that's sort of related is the the capital projects manager that uh, was mentioned last night potentially would help support the um, the buildings that are listed in this document um, the the development of those projects okay and then I do have another question and that is uh, and this this really is, is looking down the road as we do inventory and we decide what else we might want to do related to it I actually have found the old inventory of property very useful because there's pictures and, you know, it just gives history of each of the buildings. And so I'm just wondering as we, you know, upgrade, as we agreed we would do the whole inventory thing, we want to consider at least on the property side, looking at that, and maybe even on the vehicle side, pictures of the vehicles. Lynn, are you referring to the um, facility report? Yeah. From 2015? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That that document um, informed a lot of what's here, um, and it's a really nice document. I don't know if, I guess we'd want to talk about whether that's an inventory or just uh, something we normalize in our process every so many years. I think Jeremiah is looking at that, um, yeah. but I agree with you. That's a really nice document. I think Ron Bahanowitz uh had put it together the last time it was done. And um, it's, you're right, it's nice to have that narrative to go along with the with each facility. And the actual pictures. Yeah. <laughs> it or not, I mean, people look at it and say, oh, I didn't know we owned that. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so Jeremiah is working on that. He's finding a lot of uh, discrepancies in the material that was in the 2015 report. So it's gonna take some time to get that up to speed, but he is working on that. Anything else, Lynn, or otherwise uh, call Dorothy? Um, I am taking the risk of asking um, a really stupid question, but I have a memory of us being assigned to sections and I, I have notes, but I haven't gone digging through the notes. I think maybe I was assigned to the library, but I need that to be confirmed. And then we're to do, to look at this particular budget. Uh, I'm not, I, in other words, I need to have a much clearer description of what my task is and how I proceed with it. Yeah, um, my apologies, Dorothy. Actually, Lynn brought it up earlier in the meeting. I'm gonna send you the library's budget. Oh. Um, it's, it's not super long, which is nice. And it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a nice package. Um, at the end of this meeting, I'm gonna send it to the full group, but you'll get the, everyone will get the school budgets, but you'll also get the library budget. And that's the one you should focus on um, to review and, and see what Great. questions you may have. Thank no, you. That, very that was much. A, a very good question. Okay. Thank you. And yeah, just uh, for the uh, council members, uh, just remember that in last night's packet, um, one of the things that's included in the packet was the budget, something called budget review calendar. And right. the calendar had the dates for each presentation, the estimated time, who would be there, and um, who the committee member signed. And I think I sent it to um, any three resident members and one of my, I keep trying to remember to do that every time I, something comes up. If I didn't get that one, I'll make sure I did. We get, you get it too. Um, Thank you. Lynn? I do, yeah. So, but, Building on Dorothy's question, and Dorothy, there is no such thing as a stupid question when it comes to finance, never. Uh, the, um, do you want us in our reviews to also look at that portion of the capital that pertains to the area we're looking at, or how are we doing the overall capital? Do you want my thoughts, Andy, on that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so. I view the capital sort of as a collective. Um, it's sort of its own topic for the whole group. Um, I think it's certainly if, if you have questions on the capital improvement program, it probably does make sense to kind of save them for when the, um, when the department comes up and ask them at the same time. Um, but in terms of, I don't think nobody was like assigned to it or anything like, like specifically capital. I think that's the full, full committee. And we've already had JCPC who vetted it all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. JCPC's have done a fair amount of work on it. The one mm -hmm. area that I think we need to be very careful about that is with the enterprise funds, because uh, enterprise fund capital is not really 
historically done right. through the operating uh, or through the regular capital plan, but is funded separately because uh, it's being paid for separately. Yep. And uh, so would um, this is going to fall on Bob Hegner, unfortunately. Um, but um, the capital related to the enterprise funds is something that we do need to pick up on as we do the enterprise funds. Yeah, I, I was I was planning on doing that, Andy. Okay, thank you. Anything else um, that we want to talk about? Um, people have questions about the um, capital plan at this point. So we're going to have to, um, as we go through our agenda planning, make sure that we have a lot of time to talk about that. Since if we're going to treat it, Sean, as a committee of the whole, we have to make sure we have it. Um, have it on our plan for committee meetings. Yeah, potentially it could be added, you know, if we stick, if we do our best to be, to stick to our time allocations for each department, um, we potentially have time on the last meeting in May. Um, after all the departments have gone, we, we could come back to capital at that point. Okay, anything else? Because, uh, we're done with the budget, then we could move over. Um, Guilford, I know, is here. I don't know that Amy Rusecki is here, but uh, we were going to talk about the water and sewer rate questions. And I know yeah, I've got, a, I've got some slides I was going to bring up. We received um, questions from Kathy ahead of time, and I think we answer most of of Kathy's questions in these slides. So um, I think uh, if Guilford hops on, I think Amy was planning on, I have to look at the meeting invite to see if she was able to make it, but um, I did get information from Amy ahead of time. Um, Guilford? A Amy was coming on. I'll see where okay. she's at. I know we're a little early, I think, in terms of our schedule. No, schedule. no she was just, it was just kind of doing the wheel on her saying she was initializing. Something must have happened. Okay. Do you want me to start, Andy, by going through some of the questions? Um, we kind of split it up into things that Guilford and Amy would would answer, and then some of them were um, things that kind of fell into Sonia and, and my world. Um, I'd say go ahead. Okay. All right. So we just put together a few slides really quickly just to kind of go through some of the questions that we received. Um, the first question, this one is for Guilford, was around the, um, I, I don't know if there's an update to be given on Centennial, but more, I think the more important piece is when will we sort of get to an, uh, when will bids be done so we have sort of an exact cost on Centennial? So we, we don't have a final, estimate right now we're still finalizing our permit with DEP. Um, DEP could actually add things or take things off of the project scope. Um, so we don't have the final estimate. The estimate we do have is 13, 13, just around 13 right now, 13, a little over 13. The, um, the additional cost is basically from what they're seeing in the market in the last during the bids, during the COVID, prices have gone up substantially, either from the, either from tariffs on steel that were placed into into place before the COVID pandemic started, or because of requirements to how to operate during COVID, or the fact that plants have shut down, and things are not available. Sort of like we're seeing used car prices now soar through the roof. It's um, it's it's just a, a shortage of. Uh, shortage of material and stuff being made. We won't know the true cost or a final cost until we get a little bit farther along in the bidding process. Um, and then we still have the ability to actually cut some things out and to reduce some things to try to bring back in. And we also were trying to reach out for more funds beyond the town to supplement any overages we might have. So that's where we are right now. 
And I'll just add to that, just to step back for a second. Um, so the there was a memo in the packet that's been um, that was presented to um, that was given to the committee and also to the council that uh, explains the rate increase proposal for FY22. So water rates are going from 4.2 per hundred cubic feet to 4.6 per hundred cubic feet, and sewer is going is projected to go from 4.6 per hundred cubic feet to 4.9. And so the questions that we received um, from Kathy were about that, but also some of the out years um, that have been that were part of that memo. It gave a sort of five-year projection looking forward. And so just again to kind of reframe where these questions came from, that's what they're related to. Before you go on to the next slide, and you're just on the cost of centennial, um, I don't know if you've uh, done any thinking further about the uh, question of uh, solar panels and trying to come up with uh, net, moving a little bit in the direction of net zero, even though it's not a net zero building, uh, to try and uh, get an understanding of what the cost would be, whether that's still capable of being in there, and uh, what the operating expense savings in future years would be if you were able to do that. Not asking for an answer now, but I think that you do need to expect that the question is going to be asked. I know if, uh, counselors will want to know. Gilford, do you have an update on that or do you want to wait and we can? We, we should not. probably wait. Like I okay. said, if we change the actual process in the, in the plant, that could move the electrical usage up or down. So that's something that really isn't nailed down either. But I keep saying, and I keep telling people, you're not gonna put enough solar on the building or on the parcel to make it net zero energy. It would have to be a, some type of solar facility offsite. I, I, I recognize that, but I just wanna keep, keep the question alive. Um, Sean, you can go on to the night. Um, Kathy, has her, um, Kathy has her hand up. Oh, okay, Kathy, I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. I just, um, just so people have, those who haven't remembered, it, this is an increase. 13 million is a, about a $2 million increase from the 11 we had originally said. So it's not a small increase. So one question I had, Guilford, is this, is this a timing issue at all that we've got a, a pipeline and every paper, newspaper is talking about this, you know, that the supply chain and the costs have been soaring. If we were building a year later, would it make a difference is my question. Um, do any, does anyone have a judgment? Um, we, we had a comment from the people who were uh, proposing to be the OPM for school. And they said, you should be really glad you're not bidding your school right now because <laughs> it's a crazy world out there. <laughs> Just be really glad, you know, that you're, you're gonna be doing it later. So I didn't know both can we, is that even feasible for the town to move the plan construction into a, a future date that's a bit further out and would it make a difference? Right now we can't really move the, the construction too far away because we are working in a five-year window to get the source back online. DEP gave us that requirement that we have to have this back online in five years. Um, as we move a little farther, maybe we can get some relief from that. But the one thing that's not changing in the world right now is DEP regulations. They're staying pretty firm and fixed. Um, no, no COVID exemptions and no real COVID uh, buys or waivers. And is DEP state plus federal or is this mainly this at, at which level of government is is the rigidity? On the on the water side of our business, the rigidity and DEP is the state. Okay. If I could just add to that. So there are multiple factors here. We, you know, we have historically low interest rates, which motivates us to act now. And then we have rising construction costs, which 
which says, oh, you should wait. And so I think we just have to make some judgments. The key thing here is that the federal government has allocated significant funds into water, sewer, and broadband projects. This is something we're going to actively pursue and hope that this will complement the work that we're already doing. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. I, I can move off this question. Okay. <laughs> As I recall, this facility is in Pelham. And so my question, uh, going back to the solar, is what complications are we anticipating of running into trying to put solar on a building that's not even in our town? Well, uh, putting solar on the actual building will be easy. The building has an open site and has a good, actually it's kind of a Western facing front so the little amount of solar we can put on the building will be easy. It's just a matter of what does that little bit of solar give you? Does it power the computer that's in the lab or does it power one of the filters? It, I don't think it'll power one of the filters, but it might power some of the smaller incidental things around the building. Thank you. I think that the problem that uh, you're allude, alluding to, as I recall, as we talked about the fact that we own a lot of land up there nearby because of the uh, to protect the watershed we own that land. But whether we can build on that land is a matter of uh, either state regulation or town of Pelham regulation is the unknown. I think that I got, did I get that right, Guilford? Uh, it's actually state regulation will let us build a they'll let us build a solar facility on watershed land as long as we're powering a watershed facility a water facility. Um, the other the issue the really big issue is whether we really want to clear that much uh, timber land that forest land in Pelham to uh, to build the facility. Okay, so let's go and keep going with other members of the committee. Uh, Pat. Thank you. Uh, Guilford, you said that uh, when you were talking about the cost, the 13 plus million, you talked about some things could be cut out and I'm wondering what they are, if, if they, it was necessary to cut them and what makes them less, not necessarily essential. And if they're not essential, why are they being included? The things we would cut out are things that maybe possibly we can do at a later time or we could contract with a, a bigger contract. When you, when you build a building, you have site work, which includes paving the parking lots and paving things like that. Um, if we take that out of the Centennial project and put it into either the um, a regular paving project or we wait a year or two to pave the parking lot, that's something we can do, but we still will end up doing it. It's just how we, we phase it. The big things we have to make sure we do is build the building, build the clear well, um, build the filters and get all that stuff working. And then, then we can look at some of the things inside the building and outside the building. Well, we can take a little longer or we can do it ourselves or we can put it in another contract and maybe save a little money. That's the things we'd be talking about doing. Um, we have kind of cut down just about everything we can cut down in the building right now that we don't think we absolutely have to need. So those are the, those are the cost savings we're looking at next. Thank you. Yeah, um, Dorothy? Um, I wanna challenge uh, Guilford's comment about since you can't provide enough power to run the whole facility with the solar you could put on the roof, it's not worth doing. Um, because it's like saying, I can't get back my figure of my youth, so I'll just eat all the desserts I want. I mean, I, I think that the energy people, and I'm not a total, total diehard energy person, would think that everyone should do their bit, and it's better than if we don't. So argue with me. Yes, ma'am. Um, what, I, what I would say is right now, the goal is to get the water plant running. There may be a time in a year or two down the road where it would be more cost effective through another mechanism than building the plant and another process such as a lease type rental option with a company that does solar to put some solar on the building. 
but right now right. there's really if if the if, I, if we could run the whole plant off of solar that's on the building, I would say we should pay the extra money right now and do it because your savings would begin now. Um, but that's not the case in the amount of solar we can create on the building, and that's why I would say that's something to put off and maybe do a year or two down the road if we wanted to, and do it in a different way than bidding it out with the construction of the building and the facility. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm just going to conclude this uh, and then get on back to the slides is uh, just my own observations over time. We have a tremendous investment up there in Pelham. And it's in, if you've never been up there, you should try sometime just to go and walk around a little bit. But there's a network of reservoirs and um, uh, all working towards streams and collect um, rainwater, store rainwater, bring the bring it through the intake reservoir and into the plant. And uh, you know the amount of land, the amount of investment in that infrastructure that has been put in by the town of Amherst over the years is tremendous. So between protecting the tremendous investment that's been made over a long period of time and um, the um, what we talked about previously in the council and in this committee, but just being able to get um, protect as many water sources as we can for the future. Um, I think it's really important to get that big picture and keep in mind that, um, yeah, this is a big investment, but um, we have a big, we also have a big investment we're protecting. Uh, Sean, you want to go on to the next slide and keep going? So this slide, the, the follow-up question or the next question that was asked was, if there is an increase um, for Centennial, what is the impact on the, the financial information that we provided already? So the, the five-year enterprise fund forecast that we provided incorporated the $11 million project um, that is in those out years, which is why the rates are going up um, to, to meet that debt payment. Um, so one thing I just wanted to point out is that the estimate that we use for Centennial that is in those five-year figures was on a 20-year debt schedule. Not a, It could certainly be a 30-year debt schedule. So if there is an increase in cost there, um, one way we could potentially mitigate the impact on the rates would be if we wanted to stretch it out. Um, keep in mind, if we stretch it out, we're paying higher interest costs. So it's not something we necessarily want to do, um, but it's something that could be considered. So that's one piece. Um, and then there was a question about what is the impact on the rate itself if there was an increase in the, in the project cost. Um, so we don't have an exact number. Um, the financial advisor hasn't worked on this yet because we don't have an exact cost of what it's gonna be. Um, but just to give us sort of a ballpark figure, um, if, if the increase in the cost was a million dollars, if we paid that out off over 30 years, um, it would be in the ballpark of a $63,000 payment per year. Um, so I just showed sort of the first 10 years of what that would look like. And, and so that, that equates to roughly six cents on the rate. So $60,000 is roughly six cents on the rate. Um, and the million isn't to mean anything in particular around a million. I just figured that was the easiest way to kind of, you, you know, if it's 2 million, you can multiply by two. It makes it easy to think about. Um, the next question was on comparing the, the five-year rates that were given in FY21 to the five-year rates that were given in FY22. Um, there really aren't huge differences between the five-year rates that were projected in 21 versus 22. There are some differences, which is not unexpected that things would change a little bit in a, in a year. But um, what you're seeing on the screen is sort of the five-year projection of rates that was presented back in June of last year for FY21. And the, uh, the five-year rates that we just um, provided you in the memo back in April. And so I just kind of laid it over the top so you can see what 22 projected last year versus what's proposed for 22 this year, 23 and 23, 24 and 24, 25 and 25, and then 26 is new for, for this year. Um, so the, you know, this is water, 
water is, is a little bit higher. Um, and in part, that's because the consumption was lower for we're projecting the consumption to be uh, reduced for another year. Um, and then the debt payment itself, um, I think we are projected to start a little bit sooner than it was projected to start five years ago. Um, or not five years, sorry, last year, uh, we're projecting the debt payment to begin for Centennial a little bit sooner. So if, again, if you compare these rates, actually, if you get to the out years and what we just projected recently, the rate's actually a little bit lower than what was projected last year. So last year we projected that in five years, we would be at $5.46 for the water rate. And in this most recent one, we were at 524. So that actually dropped a little bit. Uh, but again, these are all moving targets that are based on assumptions of expenses that are gonna change a little bit year to year. And this is the same sort of analysis for sewer. Again, if you look at the projected FY25 of sort of where we end up, it's pretty close um, in terms of the rate that's needed um, between what was presented in FY21 and now what we're presenting for FY22. Um, Kathy, that was your question. Does this give you the information that you were looking for? Yes, it does. Thank you. And again, a lot of the differences are on the timing of the debt. Um, in, in FY21, we hadn't authorized the debt yet. We were sort of making um, more of a guess about how the when that debt would start. Uh, we have more of a timeline this year to project how that debt will come onto the books um, in phases. Um, Guilford's got a much more um, well-defined timeline for those projects. So that's a lot of what the changes that you're seeing. And then the last piece of this was um, looking at the rate comparison with other towns. And I will, I think, turn it over to Amy to talk about this slide. Okay. Um, and so this was at, um, I think it was Mandy Joe um, asked, just, you know, as we're looking at how the rates compare to other communities, rather than looking at this statewide average usage of 120, 100 cubic feet um, per year, instead looking at what the Amherst water user who, you know, obviously we're, we're a little more conservative um, with our water usage in this community. And so I looked at, um, we looked at what the average water usage is um, for an average Amherst household, uh, as well as um, a median household. There's a couple of residences that use a lot of water, whether they're, you know, watering their lawn and that sort of thing. And that's why the average usage um, is a little higher. And then the median, so the actual middle, you know, mid exact middle household is actually lower because there's a lot more people on the conservative um, water usage side. Uh, but either way, so this shows a comparison um, with the other communities, which you can see. Um, and you'll actually notice I, I sorted it by the average, but you'll see that when it comes to the, the median, they're in a slightly different order. And it's because some communities have flat fees and then water usage above it. Um, and that's why, you know, when you take that into account, um, they, they don't necessarily rank in the same order. But um, either way, so hopefully this gives a little more of an apples to apples comparison on how this is going to impact the average Am Amherst household or the median Amherst household. Um, depending on where you think you fall. Um, and then on the side is just um, some information on how this is really going to impact our water bill um, and our sewer bill. So, you know, for Amherst, you know, we're looking at an average increase with the rate going up this year of, you know, $37 on our water bill and 28 on our sewer bill. And then similarly, the median household will have an increase of $23 on their water bill and $17 on their annual sewer bill. So... Hopefully that answers kind of the, the questions that Mandy Joe was looking at. I'll take any questions. Hey. Kathy. Yeah, I, I think that's great. Um, it, my qu question is if can, I, I think the answer is yes, but if I, if someone wanted to say, and where will the median household be uh, in by 2026. All we do is multiply, assuming that use stays about the same, we multiply it times the rate in that year. Is that correct? So if people want to say, how much is my water bill going to go up? Not just next year, but five years from now. Is that? Okay? Yeah, so that's, that's what they could do, at least for the Amherst usage. It yep. gets a little trickier with the other communities because sure. some communities, you know, have that flat rate. So it's not as easy as just, you know, exponentially increasing or whatever, um, prorating it, I guess. 
Um, but yeah, that, that's a good way to calculate that out. Okay. Thank you for, thank you for doing that change. We're a low user too. <laughs> so. Great. Other, other questions? Um, I guess, have you, by, by the way, Amy, have you uh, sent this um, information to uh, Mandy since she was one who was the originator of the question? Uh, I didn't yet. This was information. It, it took, it's not as easy to just kind of come up with a median household. Uh, we actually had to crunch a year's worth of billing data for every single, you know, resident in town and kind of crunch it. And so, you know, obviously the, the billing department did a lot of work with that. Um, yeah, so we just kind of got this together for this meeting, but but certainly happy to share that. Um, yeah, and I will say that that does mean that the average and the median, like, we'll keep in mind that that's the average and the median based on this last year. And th those numbers are going to go up and go down a little bit. Um, so, you know, we, we can talk about what we want to do in the future if we want to look at water bills and sewer bill impacts like this and how often we want to update that average and median. So. And Andy, I think this is also a broader interest. So if Amy, get, if we can download the tables we just did, we can put it in the finance committee report, Great. you know, so that others could use it, you know, trying just uh, residents trying to figure out, so what's, what's going to happen to my water bill? Yeah. Um, I was actually just going to ask Sean if he would mind just putting the whole slide deck into the, uh, yeah, I'll put it in the packet and I'll um, send okay. it to you. Yeah. So that it's available to the committee. Uh, Bob, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Paul or Sean, what specific uh, assumptions about water use and sewer use going forward you've made in terms of uh, generating these, uh, these numbers? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really important question. So for FY22, we've projected a reduced level of consumption from what is our normal level of consumption. Um, we're hoping that with the college and university, with their plans to come back, that it will come in better than that. Um, but because for the enterprise funds, water and sewer, they rely so heavily on this one revenue source, we wanted to be extra conservative um, with sort of the projection. So we are projecting one more year, FY22, at a lower than normal rate. Um, you know, for water, we're usually around, I won't get the, uh, the uh, description perfectly right, but we're around a million hundred cubic feet. Is that right, um, Amy? Okay. Um, and we're projecting, I think 90, we're projecting 90% of that for FY22. Um, and then once we get beyond FY22, we're going back to sort of that normal level. Um, it's something that we are going to have to monitor on an ongoing basis because there's lots of initiatives that are reducing water consumption. Um, when these new buildings come online, especially when they replace older buildings, they're, they're more efficient. Um, and so we have seen sort of a steady decrease just in general. So that is an important thing to monitor um, as we go forward. And I'd just like to add that, you know, the construction at UMass, well, you know, North Village is totally offline. Um, mm -hmm. and Lincoln apartments are totally offline. So until they get those back, but they will be back bigger, but they will be much more efficient than what they've been using water as. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to mention right now, I have this on the town council agenda on the 17th. In the past, there's always been this sense that it's better to give the public a little more time uh, once we present it to think about it and come back. So, um, and yet we don't require a hearing on water and sewer rates uh, or even a public forum. Um, so I guess I'm looking to the um, finance committee. One option is we can present this on the 17th and then not take the vote until the 24th, giving people an extra week if anybody, any residents want to weigh in. I'm open to ideas. Uh, Kathy? Did you I don't, I don't, no, I don't have a strong 
you know, some people focus a lot on this, um, you know, in town and the message last year rippled through very quickly when that five year, when the impact of Centennial could be seen. Um, so doing this, what Sean just described about having to redo things and if Centennial comes in higher, we can go out 30 years, you know, um, I mean, people are not just looking at next year, but at what's coming toward them. So, so Lynn, in terms of scheduling, I wouldn't want to change the rates again. I would want to be on pretty firm ground. Right. I mean, I can go ahead and put it on the uh, 17th. And if somebody says they want to defer, then we can still vote on the 24th. Okay. We have a um, proposed order for this, or do we just do it as a vote on the rate and that there's no order attached to it? I think, um, Sonia, did you give us an order for this today? I think I, I thought I saw one, but maybe I'm, I'm making it up. I thought I sent it to you, I'm gonna check. Yeah, if you, I put a bunch of stuff in the packet. I thought the water it's in the packet. rates. Okay, it is good. Yeah, so there is an order for this in the packet. It's in the packet. Okay, I'm gonna leave the vote then on the 20, on the 17th. And if I, some council objects, then we'll give it another week. So if, in that case, I would need to have somebody who has access to the uh, proposed order because I'm not on a computer that has all of it on it. Um, I could get that for you in just a moment, okay? So I put that order on the screen. We ought to be taking a look at the order and then take a vote on whether we recommend the order. Yep, give me a minute. And while we're while you're doing that, um, I just wanted to do one thing, and that is that I know we have one member of the public who's an attendee, and if the attendee has any public comment that is directed to water and sewer rates. Uh, you know, please raise your hand because I would want to recognize you um, before we take any vote on this. Um, I have a question, if we have a moment. Yes, go ahead, Dorothy, because uh, Lynn's looking for the order. Okay, I'd like some clarification on how rates go down. And I know that sometimes if you're talking about the mass counting in the university's buildings, it, that might be part of it. But for the individual <laughs> homeowner, who is the person that will be talking to us in terms of increases in water and sewer, um, their rates aren't going to go down, are they? I mean, I, I, I'm guessing that when you said new buildings are more efficient you're talking about plumbing and toilets because I don't, otherwise you use the same amount of water to wash dishes, to take a bath, to take a shower. So I didn't, I didn't follow that new buildings necessarily. I understand how they're more efficient in terms of heat, but I don't understand how they're more efficient in terms of water. That's number one. And number two, will any of this have any relevance to the individual homeowner? Yeah, so, um, so it's sort of, a Maybe, maybe a paradox is not the right word, but um, as we are more efficient with our water usage, the costs can rise because we bill for less. Um, and a lot of the costs in the enterprise fund are fixed costs um, related to infrastructure and managing the facilities, um, running the facilities, electrical and utilities to run the facilities. So as, as a town, as we consume less water, that that has been leading to an increase in the rate because we have to charge a higher rate to produce the same amount of, of revenue for the fund. Um, and so when, when uh, Paul mentioned more efficient buildings, it's good from an environmental standpoint, um, they're, they're consuming less water, but again, that means they're gonna consume less water. So we'll have the rates could trickle up because we're making up for that lost consumption. Um, and, and so a lot of new facilities have things like more efficient toilets that don't use as much water when you flush um, and, and the heating systems. I think there's ways to, to use less water there too in some of the newer buildings. So um, the heating and cooling systems. So that, that's some of what they're doing. Guilford probably knows a whole lot more about it than, than I do. 
Sonia, I'm mistaken. I don't have the financial. Order. I have it. I have it here. I can share it. Okay. Thanks. Bernie, your hand is up. And... Yeah, it's just real, real quick. I, mean, I had the experience in Deerfield of having Deerfield Academy improve its HVAC systems, and all of a sudden our uh, water revenue went way down. And that's part of um, heating and cooling is actually a big part of water bills. So I wanted to just uh, give you a moment as you're reading it, but what I will look for is to see if there's somebody who wants to make a motion then to recommend approval um, order FY2110. Andy, I'll do that. Okay. So I, I recommend that the Finance Committee, or I move that the Finance Committee recommend to the Town Council approval of order number FY21-10, an order setting of the water and sewer rates to be effective July 1, 2021. Is there a second? Change seconds. Okay, so there's been a motion that's made and seconded. And what I'm going to do is what I've done in uh, recent meetings. I'm going to go through um, each member of the committee just in the order that they show up on my uh, participant list. And then what I'm, if you're a member of the committee, I'm going to be asking for your vote. And if you're, um, if you're a voting member, if you're a member of the committee, if you're a non-voting member, if you have any uh, recommendation to, um, to the committee, you um, want to have your position stated to the council. Um, and before I do that, Bernie, your hand is still up. Was there something else you had or is that more for? Okay. So um, just going in the order that I have you on my list, uh, Bob Hegner. Um, I support the, the motion. Uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Lynn Griesberg. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Hi. And um, let's see, Bernie Kubiak. I agree with the order. And uh, Jane Scheffler. I agree. And I'm voting yes. I think that I have now, I, I got everyone and that the vote was five to zero and um, indications of support, um, the recommendations of the motion from the three uh, non-voting resident members. Andy, yeah. can, I, can I ask Sonia something real quick um, related to what you just voted? Yes. Um, Sonia, is the FY21 a typo? Should it be FY22? Yes. Okay. I don't know if that Matt, affects what you just voted. I um, just looked up on our grid and it's listed as FY2210. And I just don't want to mess up any, um, any order numbers. So I, I accept if... that as a friendly amendment. Okay, good. Kathy, do you accept it as a friendly amendment? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think we need to revote. Good. Perfect. Somebody else has a different of, a, of opinion on that. Um, so um, in, it is uh, the point where we said that in the agenda, estimated at three, but not guaranteed to be three. Uh, so does the uh, attendee have any public comment uh, to offer? And if so, uh, please raise your hand to let me know and then I'll uh, have you brought in so that you can uh, make comment. If So seeing nothing, um, with no indication at this point, um, and I wanna get back to, um, I can find my uh, agenda here. It is again. 
So after that, the other thing that we were going to talk about is the um, auditor procurement selection process. And uh, there was an amended version that Sean has put uh, sent to us since the last meeting that has a small number of changes that were highlighted uh, within the document. Um, does anybody want to see those on the screen at this point? And then I need to get on to the next thing, which is um, one thing that I, and by the way, Amy and Guilford, if you end up leaving, uh, because we're now no longer talking about water sewer, thank you very much for all of your work and your help. And uh, Amy, thank you for doing that putting that answer together for Mandy's question and uh, we will make sure that it gets to gets to her attention. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, the one thing that I do want to um, see if we can make a recommendation vote on um, because I, um, we want to get it on then to um, the GOL committee and back to the council is the uh, committee charge. <coughs> and, um, do you have the committee charge, uh, Lynn, or do you want? I'm getting to it. Okay, it was from the last meeting. I have it. Um, okay, thanks. So I think uh, it's pretty straightforward and it would be very helpful for the schedule that um, Lynn has in mind if uh, the committee is comfortable in making a recommendation and a charge to uh, recommend it and then pass it along to GOL and then uh, I think Lynn, you had a date you'd like to give it back to the council. Yeah, my goal was that if it can go to GOL and then comes to the council on the 17th, um, the council approves it since the appointments are all councilors and we have a process we've used in the past where I basically poll councilors to say, are you interested? Um, and then I bring that to, I bring all of the names of people who are interested to the council meeting and the council selects who is going to be on the committee. Um, so the only thing GOL needs to do is approve the charge. And so if they, if they approve it prior to the 17th, the council approves it on the 17th, we can appoint the committee on the 24th of May. So Sean, you said you have something that you wanted to? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, so I, we talked, um, Sonia and Holly and I, um, talked about this. The one thing, the charge I think looks good. The one thing that we would ask you to consider is possibly adding um, two um, non-counselors to the committee. Um, we were thinking probably one person from the finance office, probably Holly would serve um, on this committee, someone who's gone through the audit and, and knows what it's been like because we've had um, we've worked with Melanson for quite some time. So someone that really knows what's involved, at least in Amherst with the audit, um, and then possibly another uh, staff member outside the finance office. So um, that was the only thing that we would ask you to consider. I'm fine with that. I'm absolutely fine with that. I think it's a great addition. I agree. And I, I think it's, it's, it's not just great addition. I think it's probably essential to given the time, given the short timeline here. <laughs> It has to go to GOLs tomorrow if you want it on the 17th, I believe. It does. Yeah, which is why I want to. So um, if we um, add the, uh, 
the members, are we adding them as voting members or non-voting members? Because when you look at the, at the block at the top, uh, if you remember this is put together by taking uh, the process that was being put forward in the original memo and then adding the, and then just placing it into a standard charge document. That's why it's written the way it is. So it was the intent to make them voting members um, and given what the role is, is that a significant issue? Sean, do you have anything else to say on that or? Um, no, I think it's up to you, you all. Um... My guess is it'll probably be a consensus. Hopefully, it'll end up being a consensus um, decision uh, for the whole group of people. Um, so I don't feel strongly whether they're voting or non-voting. Because it's to deliver evaluations. It's not to make a selection because right. uh, that's the next step. The yeah, they're really, that's a good point. They're really, the voting or non-voting is somewhat arbitrary because they're really, everyone's just sort of doing their own um, evaluations and then giving those evaluations. I guess the question would be whether if a non-voting member, maybe they don't do an evaluation, they just contribute, which in that case, I'd probably say it would make sense to maybe include the, include the staff as participants in the evaluation process. I would think you'd want to have the staff included. Um, these audits are incredibly uh, time intensive for the staff. So um, them having an input and them do, being able to do an evaluation is, is important. Yeah, uh, I think that the other point and, um, you know, Sean or um, Sonia might mm -hmm. comment on it, but uh, as they have said before, the auditor provides uh, a lot of direct services between the audit process and being available to the finance staff to provide advice during the year so that it's not just around the audit, but other roles that they play, which I think is some of the, you know, part of the concern too. Um, Pat? Yeah, I like the idea of it being a cons consensus and I think that's how the group would work, but I do think that the staff members should be voting members. It's a respectful thing to do. Lynn? Um, I'm actually going to pose that. I, I think the staff should definitely be there. Um, I think they should um, have a, a serious uh, responsibility to provide input, but this is a contract that the council votes. And what you wanna make sure is that you protect staff from ever looking like they uh, voted on an auditor that they may have a long-standing friendship with. And you really want to keep it as clean as possible. So is the reason not to do this? I, I want the staff on there, but I want them as non-voting for that, for that reason. So I guess one thing we might want to clarify is, um, so again, this committee will be doing something similar to what the um, the RFP committee just did for or the RFS committee just did that um, Kathy was on, which will be um, receiving the, the applications from audit firms and evaluating them against the criteria that was in the RFP document. Um, and in some ways, the evaluation is because of the way we structured it, there's not a ton of wiggle room in some of those items because you're you're saying years of experience and things like that. Um, so this group isn't actually gonna vote on anything in particular, they're, they're just doing evaluation. So again, I would think about it more from the standpoint of, are they doing the evaluation or not doing the evaluation? Um, when you're thinking about this committee. I guess my concern is that um... If we don't hear their evaluation in the end, is it going to be helpful to the three counselors? I right. In the discussion, there would be value. Kathy? Yeah, so I'm just, that's what I'm trying to understand because the process we just went through, we 
assign points to each of various kinds of characteristics. We separately read them and then put our points on and came together. We were a group of five. And you would certainly want the two staff people to be doing that. And I wouldn't want their point rating to be treated any differently than the other three people's. So it wasn't even a vote. We just, we literally all looked at and said, oh, on this, if there were three firms, on this one, there's a spread. Why don't we, you talk about why you rated them higher or lower? And it, what, Pat, what you said is a cons was kind of a consensus because actually when we came together, we all ranked, one, rated one of them higher. <laughs> You know, so it was more like who was number two, but I wouldn't want them not to be assigning points with that separate independent read of the proposals. So it's not like vote. We didn't really vote. We, you know, you got 50 out of 100 points and you got 99 out of 100 points was was the way the review of the proposals went for the school. So I'm assuming since this is you're going to set up criteria, you're going to then assign them points based on each person's read. Um, you know, I've not been through an auditor thing, but as long as you have enough criteria, so I wouldn't make them lesser. Um, and then maybe the three voting people vote to approve the, the firm that gets the most points. Uh, well, of course, the, uh, in this situation, what we're doing is uh, going back into the sentence that says charge near the bottom of the screen. Yeah. That uh, they're going to receive the applications from qualified auditing firms, evaluate the applications utilizing the criteria in the RFP document and deliver evaluations, plural, to the town manager so that it wouldn't end up being a composite. It would be giving individual evaluations um, to the town manager. And of course, the question I have for you is in the process you, you just were describing, were your, evalu your evaluations were your points and they were set before you talked, before it was shared with each other. Absolutely, but I read this, Andy, you could read this. I read it that if there are three firms applying for this, you evaluate the three applications and you deliver the, ap the evaluation of the three applications. And if there are either th three raters or five raters, um, you, do a, you can do a composite or you can say the five raters, here's their rating. We, we literally just put them into a grid and um, so when I read deliver evaluations, it's not like deliver Kathy's evaluation and Pat's and I deliver it. This is the evaluation of the firm. And then what score did they get? That's how I read it. But I, as I said, I haven't picked an audit firm before. That is what we did with the OPM. Um, and we looked, we said, oh, one has more points. Is everyone comfortable with that? Um, and, and just to follow up on what Kathy said, I um, I believe probably all of that would go to Paul. So you, there would be a composite evaluation for each um, firm, but Paul could also get the individual evaluations from individual members as well. Um, so I think it's, you would wanna do a composite, but to kind of bring the group's rankings together, um, but all of the information could be given, passed on to the town manager. There's really no voting. So no, there's, there's really not. I don't think there's yeah, really so that shouldn't even that's, be there. <laughs> that's what I was trying to say. It's not voting. It's, it's, it's a, this is not a voting process. That's what I was trying to say that the whole, right. yeah, it's what you said. Yeah. So I want to understand something um, and, it, and it's based on the charter and what the charter says. The town council shall annually provide for an outside audit of the books and accounts of the town to be conducted by a CPA or a firm of CPAs, which has no personal interest, direct whatever, fiscal, whatever, to the officers of the town. The town manager shall include in the annual budget a sum of money sufficient to satisfy the estimated cost of conducting the audit. The town council shall adopt procedures for selection of the audit firm, and the clerk of the town council shall coordinate the work of the individual and firm selected. I find that a little strange. Uh, the report of the audit shall be 
file reform, et cetera. So how do we, um, <laughs> how do we interpret the words shall annually provide for an outside audit? But it's, Lynn, the no, key, it's separate, that's Lynn. not the key sentence. This key sentence shall adopt procedures for selection of the accountant, accounting firm. That's right. Okay. So we're saying we're going to just adopt these procedures and then we're going to give everything as a recommendation to the town, to the town manager, who's the only one that can sign a contract anyway, by the way. Right. Um, and... Okay, I, I have been on audit selection committees, so, and I, I we've always- The selection said, process is different than reviewing the audit where you do, where the council really comes no, into play. I've um, been on both. I've been on the selection of an audit committee and I've been on audit committees. And um, on the selection of audit committees, we have never, um, I've ne in both instances, I've never had staff actually do the ratings or the voting. And it's not because I don't value staff, it's because of wanting to protect staff. That, that's, it's my experience with nonprofits. So um, yeah. I, I, I totally want staff, I mean, as many staff as want to have a say in this, um, be there to give us their own insight into these audit firms. I just want to make sure we don't put staff in a position of somebody later saying, oh, gee, they chose, you know, they're biased because that's the firm they've always used. And we're, we know we're already up against an interesting wall anyway, because we probably only have two firms that may even bid on this. We don't know. Can we hear from Sonia? Yeah, I was going to ask Sonia next. Sonia? I was just responding to the council annually providing for an audit. I, I assume that that was annually appropriate funding to provide for that audit. Mm -hmm. so, and, and why are we involved in the selection? Except we, that usually the board of an organization is involved in the selection of the audit. I mean, I think that the problem is in the end that uh, is, is this a community, was it intended by the Charter Commission as they put this together to create a process so that the audit was a function of the council for the council to provide um, some sort of a oversight um, of the people who are handling the funds, which is all you. And uh, if that's what their intent was, then, you know, we just have to be thinking about it in those fashions. And I have not had a chance to talk to anybody, any members of the Charter Commission to ask that question, but uh, what, was, what was their intent and what makes sense? I think it's sort of Lynn is getting at it from nonprofits point of view. And I've had the same experience as an uh, executive director of a nonprofit that I always assumed that the auditor worked for the board of directors to keep an eye on, uh, on right. us who are handling the funds on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. Bob? Yeah, I just, I. Um, I'm not sure whether this is relevant or not, but I know how the federal procurement process works. And it is not uncommon for technical people who would be directing the contractor to be on the evaluation panel uh, because they have the expertise to understand, you know, what, what they need and, and whether the, the vendor can provide it. What the federal government does is it it keeps the names of the people on the selection panel uh, secret. So the vendors do not know who was on the panel. You can guess, but you can't even ask. You, it's, it's actually illegal to go to your client and say, hey, are you on the, on the, procure, on the evaluation panel for this, this uh, uh, proposal that we're gonna bid on? So I don't know whether, Amherst can do that to keep keep the members um, 
confidential, but that's a way to get around the issue of, of conflict of interest and the issue of, uh, you know, sort of someone sort of trying to game the system. Interesting question as to whether uh, this process is subject to the open meeting law and any of our staff who work on a regular basis with the open meeting law and have an opinion on that, certainly you're welcome. Well, when we had an audit committee, we were, um, we did have to uh, relate to the open meeting law like any other committee. So, uh, you know, I just yeah, think- That was the audit reviews process. This is the auditor selection process. And um, I'm not familiar enough with procurement law. Kathy? So I, the, so here's an issue as I'm reading the one sentence charge. Um, you, can, you can only apply the criteria that's in the RFP document if someone develops the criteria. So do we have, so the charge should say, the committee shall develop the criteria that goes into the RFP, right? Because that was, we had to do that with the OPM. We had to say, you know, these are the six things we care about and points for each. So, or is there, Sonia, is there just a standard when you're selecting an audit committee, there's a, a list of six things you always want and it's already got points assigned because what I'm reading, the one sentence. So the sentence in the charter is shall adopt procedures for the selection. Adopting procedures for the selection means you come up with what you want in an auditing firm. You assign key aspects and you um, evaluate them based on the criteria. So that's the part where the, the council member, the council is doing something. Um, so if we have a standard way, we always do an RFP for an audit, are those already developed? Um, what the criteria are? <laughs> Wait a minute, uh, let me clarify that because if you go back to the last- Holly has um, meeting yeah. and that long document that was attached in the, and then it was revised in today's uh, packet, the proposed RFP is in there. Right, so it's already I, been, Holly has her hand up, so she's probably yeah. answering my Holly. question. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that keeping the people that are on the um, evaluation committee a secret is not possible because of public record laws. Um, as soon as, while you're evaluating, nothing is a public record, but as soon as you choose um, your top contender, it becomes a public record. So you can't, you can't keep people's names out of it. Um, and just for the record, I wouldn't have a problem making a completely unbiased opinion on whatever auditors are, are out there. Um, it's whatever's best for the town at this point. It's all right. Sonia? Yeah, and I just wanted to remind everybody that um, choosing an auditing firm is exempt from 30B, so we don't even have to go through this process. Mm -hmm. so, and um, auditors have a standard that they have to follow that's set for them. So they come in and they tell us what they're going to do. Right basically. So I think we're overthinking a lot of this. Right. <laughs> yeah, the, the, and the criteria are all in this, Andy. They, it's already set out. It's already set out. Yeah. Right. So, we don't tell the auditor, we don't have the auditors come in and tell them what we want them to look at. Right. I mean, we do have them, we do assign some departments that we want them to review. But other than that, they pretty much tell us what they want. And the final decision is the managers. Right. And normally the town manager appoints an auditing firm. Yeah. And signs so, a box, so. Really, it's under 30B. There's nothing right now from having Paul make a couple of phone calls and bring in some firms and pick one. Right. Um, but, you know, and. and uh, right. So, Andy, can I just can I say something real quick, Andy? Yeah. I was so just, to, just to ground or kind of bring us back. So. The charter, again, to the, the key sentence that people have brought up is that the charter calls for the council to adopt a process. So we recommended a process. That was the memo we sent um, a few meetings ago 
that said, right. we are proposing an RFP process. We don't have to because it's, again, it's exempt under 30B, but we think that since you have to adopt a process, this is the process that could work for this type of um, activity. So again, we are looking for the council to, to approve the process, which would be an RFP process. This committee charge thing kind of is a new wrinkle we have to deal with because of the, uh, the, the charter change that we have to come up with a committee charge. But the key piece is that um, we are looking for the finance committee to weigh in on the process, which is the RFP document that we gave you and that we've made some revisions to. Do we have to have a committee? The committee can be, um, so if we're going with an RFP type thing, it could be a committee of one, it could be a committee of five. It, um, sure. You know, again, we went with what we thought was sort of a reasonable, the recommendation we included was what we thought was sort of a reasonable approach for this. Um, but there's since this is exempt, we're sort of, you can be, there's flexibility there. I Dorothy, and then I have a suggestion that let me see, hear it from Dorothy first. Um, I think we discussed this at a previous meeting and on, on, I guess I looked at the criteria that uh, Sean must have sent. And I thought that I said, you're giving points for various things. Why not add some points for the sample audit? Isn't that what we're talking about here? Kind of. Um, that that is what that conversation is. What we're talking about um, reviewing yeah. the RFP and and we did. A, I think you made another comment that we did um, um, implement into the latest version that was provided for today's meeting. You had, you had made a comment about maybe overweighting the experience of a firm. That's yes. right. Good. And so so yeah. we did make an adjustment to that um, yeah. in the the latest version. So I guess I thought we kind of dealt with the topic <laughs> and we seem to be agonizing. So, no, I, so I think what we're going to do is um, we, I, we wanted to get through the committee charge today so we can get it to GOL or back to the council and get the council to um, get to work on um, creating, actually populating the committee and choosing the counselors. So what we could do is where we have it written in this, um, three town, um, town councilors on that sentence to say three town councilors as chosen by the council and two members of the finance department staff as chosen by the town manager. No, I'm saying that sounds good. Paul, did you want to, you want to have that qualified as only finance finance department staff, or do you want to broaden that? And just to add to that, we were thinking that one of the members would not be a finance department staff. We were thinking it might come from outside. Um, potentially, the the uh, might be news to Athena, but potentially <laughs> Athena. <laughs> um, because she's because she's mentioned in that section of the charter, we thought she yep. might be a good um, a good second staff member. So would you just say two members of the staff? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I, I think that part. makes sense. <clears throat> Does Athena get to say no? Yes. <laughs> Only if we can. <laughs> so um, now I'm going to look for comments from members of the committee to this version. I love it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Let's send it to GOL so I can you deal do, with it. Does somebody uh, <laughs> want to I make a motion to approve this version. I second it. As amended. Well, it's, it's a motion because we never, you don't have to amend a motion that hasn't been made. Okay. I make a motion to approve the charge and send the charge to GOL. 
And I second that motion. And any other further discussion <laughs> of this topic of the committee charge? If not, it's uh, <laughs> go through go through the same voting process we did before. Uh, Kathy? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. What, Lynn? Abstain. Pat? Perhaps, no. Uh, yes. <laughs> Bernie? Cute. Yes, I agree. Do you recommend uh, I recommend it. Yeah, I have to just think. Um, Jane? I also recommend. And, uh, Bob? Recommend. And I, and I vote uh, yes. So the motion carries five to zero with no, recommendation doesn't. from the three resident members. It was four zero one, Andy. Uh, Lynn yeah. abstained. Yeah. Oh, Lynn abstained. I'm sorry. Make that correction. Um, I just want to comment. I think it's really good that Pat will be able to have been part of this discussion before looking at it over at GOL, that, 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 that helps, <laughs> helps. Okay, so um, the, the rest of the process as revised and um, that Sean sent out, um, Sean and I are gonna come up with a date to put that on, back on the agenda one last time for a meeting and uh, we will then want to recommend that back to the council, but um, we want uh, this lets, lets us go, uh, get going with the committee. So I think that that's very helpful. Um, so is there anything else that people want to raise about the audit selection process or anything else at this time? Anything that, that I didn't think of 48 hours in advance that you'd like to talk about? Because if not, then I think that uh, we've done a lot of good work today. And uh, I thank again the staff for all that they did on the uh, getting us this budget and capital improvement plan and such a great and uh, helpful new format. And uh, the hard work now is coming up. And um, if you have any thought, uh, questions about your what you're going to be doing as your role in it you know let me know let Sean know whoever seems appropriate to contact and um, I think we can treat the group as adjourned thank you thanks okay. everyone. so the meeting's adjourned uh, thank you everyone and happy birthday Andy yeah uh, hippo birdie to you <laughs> <laughs> yeah me 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 the fourth be with you <laughs> Thank you.